Think about it for a second. They have how many contests for men at pipe in the winter? Let's count them. HIC Pro, Vulcan Pro, Pipe Masters, Huey Backdoor Shootout, and there yeah. might be like one of one other one I'm forgetting. So yeah. four to five events yeah. at Pipeline every year for the last 20, 30 years for the guys. Yeah. That's yeah. how many opportunities for them to go out and surf pipe with three other people in the water. Mm-hmm. Women have yeah. never had that opportunity ever, yeah. okay? Yeah. And not yeah. only have they not had that opportunity, but every time there's a men's contest at pipe that excluded the women, not only could they not go out and surf in a heat with three other people, they can't go out and surf, period, because there's a men's event on. So that's a practice day that they are not getting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So add up all those days... For all those years, during all those months of the prime pipeline winter season, yep. that women can't even go surf the wave. Yep. Systemic sexism. Yeah. That's Kayla Kennelly. I'm Jamie Brissick, and this is Soundings, brought to you by the Surfers Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 128 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Born in 1978 in Kauai, Keala grew up in a geodesic dome built by her two surfing parents. She got her first board at age five and proceeded to dominate the amateur ranks. She liked big waves and she liked riding deep in the tube. She won her first major world tour event in year 2000 at Chopu, where she would win more events. This is from the Encyclopedia of Surfing. Thank you, Matt Warshaw. Quote, after Kennelly left the world tour at the end of 2006, her reputation as a big wave charger exploded. She was the first female to toe surf Chopu. She paddle surfed huge Puerto Escondido. And when a 2011 Chopu wipeout flayed open the right side of her face, she arched an eyebrow and posed for some pre-medical treatment photos that turned the stomachs of even the gnarliest big wave helmet. So after spending a decade ranked in the top 10 on the WCT, Keala took a break from the tour in 2007 to explore her passions for acting and music, including a recurring role as a surfer in the 2007 series, John from Cincinnati. In 2017, Keala was included in the invite list to the Eddie, becoming the first woman ever to be invited to the event. The contest didn't end up running that year, but it did run in 2023. She charged. I first met Keala in the late 1990s. I photographed her for a feature in Surfing Magazine, I was impressed by her strength and chutzpah. She was a joy to work with. These days, she lives in Hawaii, she continues to DJ, and she continues to compete as a big wave surfer. Kale and I spoke remotely. She was at home in Hawaii, and I was at home in Los Angeles. Kale, welcome to the show. Hey, Jamie, great to be here. <laughs> so at what point did you realize you had a taste for big waves? Well, I, I mean, as you know, I grew up in Hawaii. I grew up on Kauai, and... The waves in Hawaii are already bigger by default. And I grew up with like Andy and Bruce Irons were like brothers to me and, you know, Kamala Alexander. And and then in Kauai, there was just like a lot of big wave surfer legend type people. You had like, you know, like Laird Hamilton and Titus Kinimaka and Kla Alexander. Like there was just like a lot of chargers that came out of there. So we kind of looked up to to all those guys. And, you know, as a girl trying to be part of the boys club over there, you know, I just really was trying to get those guys respect. And it, if you could like charge bigger waves that earned you respect. So I think that's kind of where it started for me. Chopu. Let's talk about Chopu. What a wave, what a spot. You know, being from Hawaii, typically that would be like a summer trip, right? Going over to, to Tahiti yeah. to ride the swells over there. Mm-hmm. When did you first ride Chopu and what was the relationship like there? 
So I didn't even know that place existed. And then uh, Betty DiPolito actually is the one that told me about it. She's like, oh, my God, there's this wave in Tahiti like that, like it's right up your alley and you got to go. And I think there was like a QS event they were having there. And she's like, I think she paid for my ticket and because she wanted to film me and stuff. And she's like, come on, let's go. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll buy your ticket. You got to go surf this wave. So I went down there with her for the first time. And it was crazy big that time. I think this is before like you could go online and check like Surfline, the forecast and like see like, you know, the, the size of swells and stuff like that. So I had no idea how big it was, like one of the first days I went out to surf it. And from the beach, you really can't tell how big it is either because it breaks so far out. Like sometimes I look at it and I can't tell if it's two foot or 20 foot. So I got out there in a boat and I was just so excited. I was so pumped. And I saw this like perfect, like six foot wave just peel off and spit. And so I was like, I just like, grab my board. I didn't wait to see if that was a set. And that was not even uh, like a normal size wave on that day. That was just like a baby one that hit the reef. So mm -hmm. I paddled out and I got into the lineup and I sat right next to Shane Dorian and he was like, Whoa, KK charging. And I was just like, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like six foot. looks good. And so like I paddled for like one of those six footers that didn't even break. And mm -hmm. I turned around and like, literally it looked like the entire horizon was just coming for me. Like wow. hugest wave ever. I was like caught inside, thought I was going to die, like paddled as fast as I could to just like barely get under the lip. And then, you know, the waves are backless. Like there's no, you can't even duck yep. dive through those ones. And so it sucked me like over the falls. And this is before like, any kind of like inflation suit, safety gear, no like flotation vest or anything like that. So I got sucked over the falls and just like beaten within an inch of my life. And I got pinned down on the reef with so much force that I couldn't even like move my limbs. I was just pinned. Mm. Wow. Um, and like my life flashed before my eyes. I thought I was going to die. I had like a two wave hold down and then like the force of it kind of lit up for like one second. So I just kicked the reef and was able to get up and get a breath and then got like a next wave pounded me. And then I, I pulled my leash, like used my leash to like find my way back up to the surface. And there was just like a little piece of what was left of my surfboard because it had broken it in like three pieces. And Jeez. I grabbed on that little piece of surfboard and I paddled back into the channel and I jumped in a boat and I was just like shaking. Um, and I remember Johnny Boy Gomes was out there that day and he was like, he talked to me about it later. He's like, oh my God, I thought I'd watch my friend die right in front of, right in front of my eyes. Like that was so heavy. So wow. that was like my first experience out there. Um, and I didn't go back for like a year or two and I was pretty nervous when I went back, but then, then I was able to get like some great waves and then just like fell in love with the place. So and it, it was like, it became like kind of the way that made my name, you know? For sure. Yeah. And I remember all that unfolding. And you would have been one of the first women to surf it, I'm guessing, right? Uh, I think so. I know I was definitely the first woman to ever tow it. Okay. Yeah. I don't know about surf it, but but uh, definitely the first one to tow it big. And so given that the story that you just told of like, that was your initiation to the place. Yeah. What, what was, what was the reward factor? Like after a while you were probably getting some of the best barrels. of. I your got life. some of the best. I honestly got the best barrels of my life hands down at Chopes, you know, and I won four, I won one QS and three WCT events out there. So I, it was the wave I was most successful at in my mm -hmm. career. Um, and what about what would have been like if you were to describe the worst wipeout was it that first time or did you have worse ones that one was pretty bad um the one that huge one i got where i got nominated for the men's award and then i won the men's award the, a barrel of the year award that one i got really that was a really gnarly beating um but i would say the one that did the most damage was you know a four foot wave where I face planted into the reef and it tore half my face off. That was probably the Jeez. worst, um, 
damage. It wasn't a bad wipeout. It was just until mm-hmm. I hit the reef and then it, yeah. Just to clarify for our listeners, what was the award that you got that, w- that was in the men's division as well? So uh, <clears throat> they had this uh, award at the XXL Awards. Um, it, it was technically like an open gender category, but like we just considered it a men's award because nobody ever thought a woman could even be nominated, let alone win one of those awards. Mm-hmm. And so like, yeah, I was just so pumped when I got nominated and, and then I ended up winning. Uh, and that, that's right. probably, I consider that probably the biggest accomplishment of my career was yes. that, winning that award, beating all the men. Yeah. That's so great. And on the note of open gender, we, we you and I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, but um, we talked about the Eddie and this was the first year they opened it up to women, but it was mixed, right? It wasn't like a specific women's division. Technically they opened it up to women in 2017. I w- was the first woman to ever be invited just me by myself. And I remember okay. going to the opening ceremonies as the first female invitee and sitting in this huge circle of the best male big wave surfers in the world as the only female and just feeling like very outnumbered. <laughs> 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 but yeah, uh, so that, that was the first time they'd ever invited a female. It was 2017 and then, but they never ran the contest. So okay. They ran it in 2016, and then the first time a female was invited was me in 2017, but then there was like a seven years where they never ran the event. And in those seven years, uh, they slowly started inviting more females. So, I mean, that just goes to show, you know, how far equality has come in the last seven years. Now there was six of us instead of just me. Yeah. So that made it even more special because I got to like share that moment with five of my big wave sisters. Mm-hmm. But you would share the heats with men. What was that like? Yeah. So I had really mixed feelings about the format because on the one hand, um, it was really cool and inspiring to be in heats competing directly against the men. Cause they, I mean, they're just so awesome at what they do and they charge so hard. Um, and they were all very welcoming towards the women. They were all very encouraging towards the women. But obviously, they're there to win. And, you know, they're they're bigger. They, they have more upper body strength than us. They paddle faster. They can sit deeper. So it was definitely made it a, a lot more difficult to get the best waves out there when you're surfing against the best men in the world. So I would have liked to see at least one round, one of the two rounds with just all women's heat. Cause I feel like Mm -hmm. had they done that, we could have possibly gotten some of the better waves in that heat if we weren't competing against the men Mm -hmm. to get those waves. Yep. But with YMA Bay and the Eddie, they're, they're typically softer on the interferences, right? Like you can technically share a wave or I'm not, I'm always, I've always been unsure how that works. They're softer on it, but I wouldn't purposely drop in on anybody. I mean, in my first round, I was surfing in the heat with like Landon McNamara and he was deeper than me on, on a, f- a few waves. He was always like a little bit deeper than me. Like there was a couple waves I really wanted, but he was deeper. And one of those waves, I had already like started stroking like really hard and was kind of committed, but I like saw him out of the corner of my eye deeper than me. And like the last thing in the world I want to do is like take off on somebody and like, what if I wipe out? What if I, Mm -hmm. my board hits them? What if I land on them? What if I mess their wave up in some way? So I actually like pulled back as hard as I could knowing that doing that, I was going to go over the falls. And I did, I went over the falls behind him and just took the hit because I just never, I never want to, um, burn somebody or Mm -hmm. hurt somebody, you know, wipe out in front of somebody. Yep. Or even just like mess up their wave. You know, I had, I had one of the guys, uh, drop in on me. I had a uh, Justine drop in on me too in the second round, but I had one of the guys drop in on me and I had to readjust my line right as I was taking off to make room for him. And right then I hit a chop and mm-hmm. you know, ate crap. So it definitely like can negative, really negatively affect the other surfer. If you drop yep. in, even though the, the, you know, their interference rules aren't that strict. Sure. I, I still yeah. think it's best practice not to. Yeah. Yeah. That's in. interesting. 
and and you've you you've made a reputation on some of the, the like the heaviest waves in the world and and I'm and I'm guessing I don't surf these spots but I'm guessing there's some of the heaviest lineups in terms of how to get a wave out there like Chopu uh, pipeline like there's not a lot of margin for error it's not like surfing Malibu on a six foot south swell <laughs> yeah. where pe- people are sharing waves happily and whatever no like, absolutely the, the, not absolutely these are not. slab waves ledgy waves um, what's that like what's it like being you know, I guess like one of the few women in the lineup in these breaks. Well, when I first started surfing like pipe as an example, uh, as one of the only females out there, you know, it'd be like me and like, maybe like me and Rochelle, Rochelle would surf it a lot back then with me. But, you know, when you're like the only, one of the only, or the only woman in the water back then, the guys just would not like, first of all, the attitude back then was like, what are you doing out here? Like, mm-hmm. you're a chick. You don't belong out here. You should go in. Like, that was already the attitude. Wow. And yeah. then, you know, when I'd paddle for a wave or, uh, you know, catch a wave, guys would just burn me. They would just look right at me and burn me because it was just like, I don't know if Jeez. they were trying to teach me a lesson, like that I shouldn't be out there, or they just couldn't comprehend that a chick was actually going to go, you know? And even though, even when I had proved to them over and over, like, no, I'm going to go, I got burned so many times. Wow. That is so disappointing. Yeah. Luckily, like, like that's changed. You know, girls go out to pipe now and the guys are very respectful and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, they seem to be welcoming and encouraging. Like I always see all the guys, you know, cheering on like Moana and Carissa and stuff. So, you know, that is definitely the attitude towards women out there has definitely changed, but <laughs> I had to go through some, some hazing uh, to get to that. No, I, and I can imagine I, w- and in, in, in my sort of pro surfing days, I, I witnessed a lot of that. And it's interesting. I mean, surfing, it seems like it's really swung the other direction to be um, open and championing women. Obviously there's been like the prize money uh, parody that they've done. Um, but it's, it seems like it's almost like it's, it's almost making up for a lot of years where it was like terribly, brutally sexist, which is the era that I came from. And I, I watched firsthand. Oh yeah. It was, it was, it was really gnarly. I mean, not just the like blatant prize money parody, but I mean, I remember going to events when I was on tour and they'd run, they start running an event, like for an example, like a snapper and the waves would be really good. And, and of course, they'd send the men out because the waves are good. And then as soon as like it turned on shore and the tide changed and it turned to absolute crap, they would literally stop the men's heats in the middle of the round. They wouldn't even finish the round. And they'd be like, okay, chicks, you're up. And they would send the chicks out. Wow. Just blatant. It was just so blatant of like, okay, the waves are crap now. So bring the boys in, send the girls out. Mm-hmm. You know, that's so intense. Um, yesterday we talked a little bit about you, you, you talked about coming out as lesbian and how that was like basically career suicide. Yeah. And I knew it was going to be, I mean, I, even before I got on tour, um, I pretty much kind of knew I liked girls, but, uh, was it like in, in, in denial? Cause I just didn't want that for myself. Cause I knew that was gonna be a hard road. Um, but even prior to getting on tour, there was already cautionary tales of like, oh, don't be a lesbian, like, you won't have a career, and, like, don't even associate with the, like, known or presumed lesbians on tour because you'll you'll get tagged as a lesbian by association and it'll ruin your career. So That's so insane. Yeah. Um, and when I got on know, tour, I felt like it was an immediate witch hunt to see if I was a lesbian because, you know, I was a tomboy, and it was, it was probably pretty obvious, but, like, I felt like the tour was so hard for me because I just felt like I was on, like, under a constant microscope of scrutiny of people trying to find to, to, to basically out me. And, you know, lesbian was like a, such a derogatory term that was thrown around, uh, just mm-hmm. so much negative connotations on that word. Um, because it was almost like, and the men used it a lot. They, you know, the guys were awful on tour at first trying to, you know, disparage you and, and call you a lesbian. Um, and they, they used it, it was like an insult because it was like, if they could call you a lesbian, if they could prove that you were a lesbian, that somehow discounted your ability as a surfer Uh because, oh, well, you're just like trying to be like a man. So like 
the fact that you surf good, it like diminishes your skills because you're, you're a lesbian. You're just, you're, you're, you're not feminine. So it, it, you know, your skills don't count. It's so surprising. I mean, I think, um, surfing has made so many great leaps forward in, in, in terms of the, the growth of the sport, the acceptance of the sport. Um, when I came to it and I was on the tour in the eighties, it was like a very, it wasn't a viable career path. Everyone was just sort of trying to get by at the side of the contest at the end like halfway through the event, you'd see people selling their old boards just so they could pay for their hotel room. Oh yeah. You know? When I, when I got on the tour, I mean, there'd be girls that like we go to France and they'd be sleeping in their board bags under the scaffolding and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We did. We, that was the, yeah. And that was, and it was, I'm sure it was way worse for you guys because there were the, for, the dudes were getting paid better than the women at that time. Oh yeah. The women um, were getting nothing. Like I remember yeah. going, like going in France. Luckily I didn't sleep under a scaffolding, but I remember, you know, we'd find a house and there'd be like 15 of us just all sleeping on the floor in mm-hmm. one house just to like do the event, you know? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, no, but it's all, always disappointed to me because the surfing world that I came to when I was a young man, what attracted to it, me to it the most was the fact that it seemed really open-minded. It seemed like a kind of gathering of misfits. And I grew up in Malibu in, in Los Angeles, which... It was, there was, it was a very, di- it was one of the more diverse lineups that I've ever encountered in my life mm-hmm. um, to this day. But I think when I got into the pro ranks and then I was sort of on tour with everyone, there was, it was way more narrow minded. It was way more of like an in club than I ever imagined. And I was always a disappointment to me because I just felt like it was a bit of a bubble, you know? Well, surfing kind of brands itself as this like, very like free and like easygoing, like, you know, lifestyle, but it's actually on the inside, very conservative. Yes. You know, like the brands and stuff are very kind of conservative and it's just like, it, it's just not in alignment with the way surfing is perceived from the outside. Absolutely. It's like this freedom. There's a lot of flesh exposed, like it going back to uh, early Hawaiian days when the missionaries came over, it was this thing that was like threatening their religion agendas because everyone was sort of half naked in the water. And I think that is still there. People have this impression of it. But yeah, when you get to the inside of it, it's a little bit more kind of homogenized and narrow than than you might expect. Well, the brands have no problem showing flesh if it's girls in bikinis and like, you know, thongs and ass. But like very conservative in a sense of like, you know, LGBT stuff for sure. But then, but then completely like sexist. Yes. And, you know, no problem showing TNA of the girls. So no, yeah. I know. And it's, it seems like we're in a different period now, but there was a time probably seven or eight years ago where there was a lot of, where there was a lot of uh, flesh exposure. And, and I remember talking to some of the sort of seasoned girls that from my generation and they were, and I talk, and I won't mention any names, but they thought it's sort of unfortunate that like showing your ass is a way to move forward with your career. Well, it's not just surfing. I mean, look at the, look at Instagram, look at the internet, you know, look at all these influencers. Yeah. It's just like the more they show, the more, you know, followers yep. they get, the more influencing they can do. So it's it's not uh, exclusive to the sport of surfing by any means. Yeah. No, it's still it's still very prevalent in the world. <laughs> as much as we think we're getting civilized. Yeah. What about gr- growing up in Kauai, who were your who inspired you like when you were a young girl I'm guessing winning contests and sort of riding these heavier breaks than what a lot of the other girls were surfing. Who are the folks that you were looking to for inspiration? Andy and Bruce, hundred percent, like biggest yeah. inspiration ever. I just wanted to be them. Um, they, like I said, they were like brothers to me. Uh, it was kind of a boys club. I fought really hard to be in that boys club. They begrudgingly let me hang out with them. <laughs> and um, I just modeled my surfing after them. Wow. What, but I, I would imagine as much as that was, that was like a tough club to be a part of, you would have benefited because it was the, the bar was very high with those guys in every was, way, right? The bar was super high. So surfing with them all the time and like emulating them mm-hmm. is, I, I owe a lot of my talent, most of my talent probably to, to those, those boys. Yeah. And when you reflect on your career, what would you, what are you, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of changing 
people's perceptions of what is possible for women to do in heavier waves, big waves, waves of consequence. Yeah, you've done it well. Thank you. And I'm, I'm most proud of fighting for the equal pay, you know, and getting, <laughs> getting that, you know. I didn't really get to benefit from it, but the future generations will. So I'm really happy with that legacy I'm leaving behind. And also mm -hmm. getting the events back on the North Shore. Um, yeah. You know, when I quit the tour and this the WCT tour and, and went off and started pioneering the big wave thing for the women, you know, I stopped doing those events. And then it occurred to me that, well, you know, I, I live, I live on Oahu and so I go surf on the North shore every winter and I would see the events there. And then I wouldn't see the women athletes there. Mm -hmm. And I was just like confused, like, Oh, I must be here on the wrong day. The women must be off today or something. And then I realized like, no, they just weren't including them anymore at all. And then right. I started looking into it and it had been 10 years of exclusion of the women on at all the events on the North shore. And I was just like wow. mind blown because when I started competing and starting doing pro contests and trying to qualify to get on the tour, I could fly over from Kauai and women were in the triple crown. Women had an event sure. at Holly Eva with the men. They had an event at sunset with the men. They didn't have pipe, which I always wish they did, but they had, uh, Honolulu. So the women had a triple crown mm -hmm. the entire time I was on the tour. And so to see like 10 years after I'm leaving the tour that they have nothing was just yeah. shocking. So I went to our legislators here in Hawaii and we tr helped draft resolutions and went to hearings and, and um, the resolution passed and then they turned it into a bill and the bill passed. And now the contests are back for the women because you can't now pull a permit to run an event on the North shore as a contest director and it completely exclude the women. Like you have to. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a great, that's a nice breakthrough. Yeah. And so that's why you saw now see women in the pipe masters. That's not by, yes. that's not by accident. That's not because somebody was being generous. Like that was a fight. That's so, oh, I'm so happy that it's happened, and I think everyone is. I mean, it's really, really exciting to watch. Let me ask you this question. Do you think um, the reason why that hasn't happened sooner in the history of surfing, do you think it's because um, what you experienced out there where, like, if you went out as – if you paddled into that lineup as a woman, you were never going to get a wave because the guys were so kind of protective or or – disrespectful, whatever you want to call it. They weren't going to give anything away. Or do you think the standard of women surfing in heavy, ledgy waves like Pipeline has come up to a level that matched it? I think that myself and Rochelle were out there charging and getting sick barrels um, back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, yeah, very aggressive and, and extremely hard, you know? Yeah. Uh, yep. So there weren't a lot of other women that were inspired to go deal with, with that bullshit. Yep. Um, but, but people like myself and Rochelle, we were always trying to get them to have a women's pipe masters, you mm -hmm. know, that was just never mm -hmm. going to happen. And it still wouldn't be happening now. No, mm -hmm. no, I think no matter w how good the level is because contest directors were just getting away with not including the women. You know, yep. they didn't even have an event at Hollywood two years ago. They didn't even have an event yeah. at Sunset two years ago. Like yep. the permitting rules needed to be clarified that you cannot, you know, when you run a contest on the North Shore, you're using state lands. And it says in the state constitution, you cannot gender discriminate mm -hmm. on state lands. So I, I think they would have, I don't think you would have seen a women's pipe masters had, had the rules, had the permitting uh, rules not been clarified to wow. force people to include the women, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and now yeah. that the women are included, now you're seeing the level just exponentially. Grow. For sure. Like in a short amount of time, we've really seen it just leap forward. Because they're finally getting that opportunity. Because think yeah. about think about it for a second. 
women have never had a con uh, pipe masters contest pipe. They've had like the one star QS that Betty DiPolito would try and do every year, but they would give her permit in April when the season's over. So it's mm -hmm. not ever going to be peak season proper pipeline for her event. Mm -hmm. God bless her for trying. Uh, but they have how many contests for men at pipe in the winter? Let's count them. HIC Pro, Vulcan Pro, Pipe Masters, Huey Backdoor Shootout, and there yeah. might be like one of one other one I'm forgetting. So yeah. four to five events yeah. at Pipeline every year for the last 20, 30 years for the guys. Yeah. That's yeah. how many opportunities for them to go out and surf pipe with three other people in the water. Mm -hmm. Women have yeah. never had that opportunity ever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And not yeah. only have they not had that opportunity, but every time there's a men's contest at pipe that's has that excluded the women, not only could they not go out and surf in a heat with three other people, they can't go out and surf period because there's a men's yeah. event on. So that's a practice day that they yep. are not getting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then, yeah, no, it's yep. So add up all those days. For all those years, during all those months of the prime pipeline winter season, yep. that women can't even go surf the wave. Yep. Systemic sexism. Yeah. Looking at it now, what do you think is most lacking? Like if you're watching a WSL event, if you're watching a, any contest at pipeline, what are you uh, thinking, oh, you've got it wrong, you could be doing it this way and it would be much better? I don't really have any criticisms on how the events are being run now. Like I, uh, I qualified for the challenger series last year and I thought, Oh, like what the hell, you know, um, let me go, let me go do a couple events on the challenger series. I mean, it's a, it's a hor hor horrible idea. I'm 44 years old. Like I, I no way I'm going to get out of a heat with all those young girls. But I think a part of me did it just to go experience what the tour is like now that there sure. is equal pay and just kind of do like an audit of like what how is it now and uh happily i can report that i was at snapper and the waves would you know that scenario i gave you earlier where they'd have a men's round going on and then the, the it would turn on shore the, the tide would change and the waves would get bad but they would finish the men's round Mm -hmm. they would finish the rounds. They wouldn't stop and yes. send the girls out when it turned to trash. So yeah. yeah, I feel like, I feel like it's being run properly in that sense. Mm. But the thing that's lacking to, to go back to your question, I think the thing that's sure. lacking is not in how the contests are being run. It's in the endorsement deals. Well, that's what or, I was, I was going to, you're, I, we talked briefly yesterday, and you told me you're making more money from DJing than you are from surfing. I make no. I not, make I make zero dollars from surfing. Just so you know, you have no sponsors, and you just competed in the Eddie, and you had recently you've you've won like big big awards. You've you've you're still achieving in your forties, but no sponsors. No, no sponsors. That's un, that's too bad. It is what it is. I make money. Doing gonna, I make money doing other things. I'm happy. I don't, rely, I don't rely on the surfing industry to pay my bills. Yep. And I'm glad that I don't because it's, you know, I've, I've had points in my career where I had sponsors and I was making decent money and that was great. And then, you know, like I said, I came out and lost all my sponsors and then was in a really bad predicament for a very long time, went into a ton of debt. I was probably about 60 to $80,000 in credit card debt at one point, just, Wow. You know, putting flights and things on credit cards so I could chase that next big swell because, like, this is who I am and this is what I do, but, like, had no backing. So, I mean, Jeez. there's there is no security in that industry. There's no security for athletes. Definitely. And, and there's a, it's a, it's a, sh it's a short uh, shelf life that most athletes kind of have to face the music in what is, like, not even the halfway mark for most lifespans, you know? Yeah, I'm incredibly lucky I was able to extend my career as long as I have because most athletes on tour, like once they hit late 20s, 30s, like it's kind of like curtains for them. And 
Yep. This industry is brutal to the athletes because it's like, you know, you go from like being a superstar, sponsored, paid athlete, making, you know, decent money traveling the world to just getting dropped on your ass with yeah. nothing. And most of these athletes, you know, they put everything into their surfing careers. They didn't go to college. You exactly. Know? They yeah. have nothing to fall back on. That's why no. you see a lot of like, sad to say, but athletes committing suicide after their career because they don't know what to do with their 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 life. They have nothing. I when I lost all my sponsors and had to like go work like normal civilian jobs, mm-hmm. I was working for minimum wage. Wow. I had no wow. college degree. I had no work experience. You yeah. know, work experience, quote unquote work experience. Sure. I, I was like, you know, working in cashier or working in cafes or painting houses or doing catering jobs, I've bartending. I've done so many jo- like jobs that are just like minimum wage entry level jobs because there's no, there's nothing for athletes when they're done. No, and it's really tough, and it's, it has like a particular sting to it because I think for a lot of people, that's just all they've known. But when you've been a surf star and you've sort of traveled around the world and been in magazines and had people adoring you and been probably chaired up the beach having won at a final, all those things, they kind of like – they they put your uh, – your, your, your sort of neurotransmitter baseline up high and there, and it's like hard to slide below that and be happy with life, you know? Well, I think it was extra confusing for me because I'm working these minimum wage jobs and I'm in a ton of debt, but I'm still winning and breaking records and making history. Like the year I told you where I won that men's award at the XXL awards, I was, and then I was was also nominated for an ESPY award that year, and that was the year I became the first woman in history to be invited to the Eddie. I had no sponsors. Wow. So I'm curious because you said when you came out, you lost your sponsors. I mean, what was their version of the story? Did they say like you're not marketable to us yes, anymore? Yes, because- not marketable. Wow. Not not marketable is code word for you're a lesbian. Wow, that is so brutal. <laughs> they can't straight up say we're firing you because you're a lesbian, but. Not God, marketable. That, not marketable is uh, code for you're sh- over a certain age and you're a lesbian and you're not feminine. So that falls under not marketable. It's so stunning to me. You know, the thing though is there's there's a lot of horrible things in the world right now, but I must say, like in just the last three, four, five years, we've made huge strides forward with regards to that. Yeah, but at the same time, you you know, currently you see women's rights that that you know people trying to roll back women's reproductive rights. Uh, So look how far we've come, but look, look, watch us slide back. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know? Yeah. You did do one wonderful thing that is, that is enduring and that's um, an acting career and a DJing career. Can we, can we talk a little bit about that? I remember uh, John from Cincinnati. What was that? Like 2006 or seven or five. Okay. Yeah. Was that your debut or had you already done? I'd already done Blue Crush. Okay. Um, and then I think because I did Blue Crush, a friend of mine who was like actually a documentary filmmaker and was like wanted to do my documentary and then we kind of lost touch. And then she just like reached out to me randomly and was like, hey, you know, what's up? This is Alex. Like I'm not doing the doco world anymore. I'm actually working with HBO and there's a TV series uh, about surfing And we would love for you to fly to LA and like meet the creators and like we'll take you to lunch and we'd love you to to be a consultant. And I went to lunch with David Milch, who was a creator, and we just kind of hit it off. And he was like, at the end of lunch, he was like, oh, I want to make you a character on the show. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, like I just in Hollywood, people tell you a lot of things. So I just was like, yeah. mm -hmm." And then sure enough, a few months later, my manager calls me up and said, HBO just sent over this contract for you to be a season regular on a TV series. And I was just like, what? And at the time, you know, I was on tour. I was on the WCT tour. And I was like, for a lot of years, you know, in the top five, like I was like number two in the world. But like at that time, I'd I'd had some like back injury issues and my ranking was kind of slipping and 
they had announced they were removing chopes from the women's tour. They had announced they were soon to be removing, I think like sunset or, or Honolulu or just, you know, some of the better, bigger waves on tour. And they, they were replacing them with like beach breaks in Brazil and beach breaks in Portugal or something like that. So I was just like really kind of disillusioned on tour at the moment. And then I got this Mm -hmm. like amazing opportunity that fell in my lap. So it just kind of made me feel like going a different direction. I probably was wanting to quit the tour and frustrated with the tour, but then this gave me like a direction to go in, you know? Right. What an interesting thing. Um, So David, I was requalified to do the tour. Like I had requalified to do the, the next, um, I think it was like 2006 season. Mm -hmm. And I gave up my spot which everybody was just like mind blown by like, what, this is career suicide. Like you're, you qualify for the tour. You're just going to give up your spot. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to go do this other thing. And it was actually cool because uh, Rochelle Ballard was like right on the bubble of requalifying and and she had just missed qualifying. So me giving up my spot, it went to my longtime friend and she got to have another year on the tour. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And then, and then just for the listeners, um, David Milch had come off of doing Deadwood, which was obviously this huge show, and he's and he's a sort of genius um, writer, screenwriter. What was it like working with him? Oh, my God. He was, like, probably one of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. He was, like, just, like, this crazy genius person. Uh, and he would, he would come to set, and he would, like, sit us down, and he would, like, explain – these scenes and all the layers of these scenes. And I would just sit there like mind blown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was, he was a really incredible guy. Yeah. I've heard a lot of stories. I I have great respect for him. Um, But how cool, I think, you know, surfing can be so singular and and myopic in its focus. There are so many surfers that that's all they want and they, they don't really look beyond, but you, you strike me and especially probably having done this and also DJing, but you've been interested in things, you know, outside of surfing. Um, would you think, was that always in you or do you think like spending time in Los Angeles, having these experiences that sort of open you up to this? I think I've always had a lot of interests, you know, when I was younger, I liked all sports. I was really into soccer Um, and then, you know, my focus became like a hundred percent surfing and I stopped playing soccer because I didn't want to like injure myself and have that effect, you know, whether I could compete and whatever. Um, but I've always had little other interests, uh, and thank God that I've had other interests and invested in those other interests because like I said, I support myself DJing right now. Yeah. And if I hadn't had that running parallel, to my surfing career these last 10, 15 years, I'd be in a really bad spot right now. Mm -hmm. So what's it like? So, so you live on Oahu and then you get DJing gigs. Are they there and other, you travel around for them? What is that like? So I have two residencies, two weekly residencies, um, both at like luxury hotels on their pool deck. It's really fun. And then beyond that, um, I have a DJ booker. So she books like corporate events and stuff for me. Uh, I just did one last month where they flew me over to Maui uh, to play an after party for this like company that must just be so loaded because they flew Katy Perry out to do a private concert for all their employees at the um, Grand Wailea. And then me and my DJ friend played the after party. So that was super fun. And we got to go see the Katy Perry concert. Um, Nice. And you have a clothing line as well. Yeah. So I started a clothing line and I'm really pumped on it. Um, You know, I was on tour for so many years. I I rode for one of the major surf brands, Billabong. And, you know, when Roxy for, I always wore guys board shorts ever since I was little. And then Roxy like came out with like a woman's board short. And then that kind of blew up for a little while. And I was so stoked because I was just like, I loved wearing board shorts. Um, I felt like I surfed better in them because like just wearing a bikini, I feel like I'm just digging it out of my ass the whole time, Um, (laughs) which is distracting. Uh, But I noticed even like with the board shorts back then, they weren't using the good materials that they use on the guys' shorts. You know, the guys' ones were like 
four way stretch and, you know, really mm -hmm. like made for performance. Whereas the girls ones were like, <sighs> kind of felt like you were wearing denim. <laughs> they had uh -huh. like no stretch to them and they were usually cut like way too short. Um, so I, I actually ended up continuing wearing the guys ones just cause they perform better. And, and at one point I started cutting them cause like, you know, the guys ones are like obviously too long and, and pretty unflattering on a, on a girl. So I started cutting them to like mid thigh, uh, length. And then I would post pictures of me surfing in these men's board shorts that I'd cut on like my Instagram and stuff. And I'd have all these women reaching out to me like, Oh, what brand of board shorts are those ones? Like, oh, you got like those women's board shorts you got, like they're the perfect length. And, and I was like, oh no, they're, they're men's when I just cut them. And then I was like, I was in Mexico during COVID. I went on a trip to get away from the lockdowns and a friend of mine had a surf shop down there and they had all these like really cool board shorts. And I was like, oh my God, those are so cool. And he's like, oh yeah, my friend like, you know, owns the factory and where they make them, you know, and they'll do custom ones for you. And I was like, oh my God, I would love to get just like some custom board shorts to, mm -hmm. to the perfect length, you know, for myself that, that actually fit perfectly. And so I, I went up there just with the idea of getting just some made just for me. And then it just da it like dawned on me, like, wait, I should make these for everybody. Like, there's a lot of women that want them. All my friends that I was with, you know, when I got them, they were like, oh, I want a pair. I want a pair. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, I'm not the only woman that likes to wear board shorts and wants board shorts that are the right length and made with good materials. So I decided to start a brand um, to kind of make up for that, what's lacking in, nice. in the surfing industry. So the brand's called Active. It's spelled A-K-K-T-I-V-E. Uh, and yeah, I'm a business owner now. It's so weird. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. And everybody, like people love, like women love the board shorts. Like I have women sending me pictures of them doing yoga in them, playing tennis in them, foiling in them, kayaking in them. Cool. So it's been really fun. Yeah, it's been really Not fun. So yeah, www.active.com. Cool. And when you're what when, when you're not traveling, when you're at home in Hawaii, what is like a typical day like for you? Well, today I'm changing my garbage disposal. <laughs> I'm really handy. I like home projects a lot. Um, uh -huh. So I do that a lot. I work on DJ sets for the weekends a lot. So I'm constantly like downloading new music and putting DJ sets together. I just got a new puppy, so she's a handful. Um, nice. Yeah, and then I like to I like to work out. I like to I like to cook. Great, and not a lot of surfing as we talked about yesterday, and which was you told me was a result of injuries. And I think um, we're just just sort of getting towards the end here. But I'd be curious to hear you've had like some incredible wipeouts. Um, yes, <laughs> and and also some serious injuries. What? Uh, Let's talk about some some of the wipeouts. You 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 got it. You won um, wipe out you won a year. wipe out of the year, the Red Bull Award. Yeah. What was that like? So that happened during the uh, Jaws uh, WSL Piahi event at Jaws, and they called the event on, and the, there was a lot of wind in the forecast. And when Jaws is windy, it's just so dangerous. Like, it's just so hard to make those drops with that much wind getting up under your board. And I, I only weigh, like, between 115 and 120 pounds. So I'm really light. Like, the guys, you know, they're much more husky. They can kind of, like, push their weight down and, and kind of muscle through some of those chops. But, like, being as light as I am, and especially backside – because mm -hmm. if you're front side, you can kind of like lean in on your rail and absorb the chops. So back side, you try and lean into the chops. You're just going to go over the handlebars. So I took off on a wave and it looked like I had a really good line and entry. And then right as I got to my feet, the, this huge gust of wind came up the face and got under my board. And I was even trying like with my front hand to just like keep the nose down and, and, and make it. And then my board flipped sideways and it hit me in my shin and then it flipped again and hit me in my ribs and then it flipped again and hit me in my jaw. And then I just like 
cartwheeled like three times down this huge wave. And then my leash ripped my back leg out of the hip socket. Jeez. Um, I've, I've seen the, I've seen the clip of this. It's, it's a serious Yeah. Weapon. And so that tore my labrum. Okay. And ever since and I had to get, I eventually had to get surgery. Uh, but ever since that injury and that surgery, my back leg is just really unstable. Mm. And so that's causing more wipeouts, which is causing more injuries. And it's causing just a lot of frustration for me because I feel like my surfing is absolute garbage ever since that surgery, um, Mm -hmm. just because of that instability in my back leg. So it's just like, it's kind of hard for me to watch my own surfing right now. Right. And, you know, when you're like an elite athlete that's accustomed to surfing at a certain level and then you don't you know you want to surf to your level and then above your level like yep and so when you feel like you can't even surf to your normal baseline level it's just caused like so much frustration and just a lot of discouragement and so surfing for me now i don't it's not bringing me joy it's just bringing me a lot of negative feelings and then on top of that this winter, uh, the few times that I did go surfing, I felt like the universe was just like sending me messages that I need to like take a break because I went over to the first swell over at Jaws. And first of all, I feel like I had really bad PTSD from last winter because I had a really gnarly wipe out there last winter. Um, so every time I paddle for a wave, I was kind of like feeling like I was going to throw up. Like I just kept imagining that wipeout over and over again. And mm-hmm. I was just like, felt like I was going to throw up. I didn't catch any waves. I got caught inside twice. The second time I got caught inside, there was a guy paddling, scraping like maybe 10 feet further out than me. And I thought like, okay, I think he's going to get over this. And if I can just like punch through the lip behind him, like maybe I can get over to the other side of this thing. And at the last minute, this guy bails his 10 foot gun into the lip right in front of me. I had nowhere to go. His, the wave lifted his board up. It hit me in the face. I went backwards over the falls. I came in. I thought I broke my cheekbone. My whole side of my face was swollen. I looked like some chick in LA that got filler in one side of her face and couldn't afford to get filler in the other side of her face. Like I looked ridiculous <laughs> and I was in a lot of pain. And then I came back to Oahu after that and didn't surf for a while. Cause I was, you know, getting over that injury. Then they called on the Eddie and I was just not in a good headspace. And I was like, and that swell honestly did not look very good. It looked went on shore and I was just like, God, I hope they don't run it. And they ended up not running it, so I was relieved. Um, and I, I went out and surfed that swell at Waimea just to practice. And first wave, I hit a chop and came down super hard, the whole right side of my body on the deck of my board. I thought I dislocated my shoulder. So then I like was getting over that injury. And then they called the eddy on again, and this time it ran. And we all know how that went down. But like right at the end of my final round in the eddy I had just taken that really heavy wipeout and somehow came out of that thing unscathed and I went back out and I caught like one or two more waves that I made so like happy about that but I really wanted one more wave right at the end and um I ended up getting caught inside and I scratched over the top of this wave and like with so much speed that I like kind of went airborne and then like free fell down the back of it. And when I free Mm -hmm. fell, I came face first down into the deck of chum. It was chumbo's board because I broke mine in the first round. So it's barring chumbo's board and I smashed my chin open and it split my chin open so bad that I needed like internal stitches. I needed. Yeah. So I came in and I had this big gaping gash in my chin. And thankfully, like I was able to find a surgeon on the beach. I don't know if she was part of the event or she was just a spectator, but like I had heard Mm -hmm. that she put some stitches in Chumbo who also hurt himself. So I tracked her down and, you know, showed her my chin and she was a badass chick. She was rad. 
she's like, okay, I'm going to need you to lay flat. So we got this U-Haul truck. So we're just going to put you in the back of this U-Haul truck and I'll stitch you up. So I, like, I was able to get stitched up by this, this woman at the beach, which was wow. great because I hate hospitals. And I, it was the Eddie. I didn't want to like leave before it was over. So I was and she bit, shot you. She gave you a little shot of it, some sort of. Yeah, anesthesia. thankfully she had some novocaine because I've I've okay. gotten stitches without novocaine and it's it's not a fun experience. But yeah. she did an, an yeah. awesome job. I mean, you can barely see. I have like a little scar now, but. Wow. But uh, it was a, yeah. So I just feel like surfing. the universe has been trying to send me little messages that I need to take a break. Um, mm -hmm. And every it's not the message I want to hear. Yes. But every time I ignore the message, I get hit with another message. And at this point, I keep getting hit in the face. Like the universe is trying to slap me across the face until I get this message. Thank you so much. It's really great talking to you, Kayla. Yeah. Nice to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Take good care and I hope to see you soon. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is Ohana by Farmer Dave and the Wizards of the West. Soundings is brought to you by the Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surfer's Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Soundings, and until next time.